let's get started. Like I said, my range of motion is going to be kind of limited today because I'm recording this lecture. Uh, hopefully, I don't fall or I mean trip over anything as I do the lecture. Um, let me change my display screen. Just give me a second. This is very awkward. <clears throat> So what we're going to do today is calculate the look, learn how to calculate the gravitational field due to a continuous mass distribution. Okay, question? Do we write this as a vector field where like the vector is the x and the y inside of it? Or do we just do it as a vector field? Well, it is a vector field, but I mean, we, we're still going to be working with the equations, right? I mean, the, the gravitational field is a vector field because when you put an object in space, you end up assigning a unique vector everywhere in space because of that mass. Do you write it as a vector or with the x and y inside that vector? Yeah, you write it as a vector. You, I mean, with, with, with x and y components. last time, I think we just wrote the equation of gravity. Well, we wrote it, I use a unit vector R hat, right? So I, I, I had the magnitude in a unit vector R hat, that's how I wrote it. But then if I wanted to be specific, I can write it in X and Y components. So I still wrote it as a vector, okay? Um, and in, in some cases, I'm only going to focus on, focus on calculating the magnitude of the vector, all right? So um, I just want to check my, sorry. I have one screen. <laughs> okay. Um, how do we do this calculation? And I need one more thing, sorry. My keyboard. How do we do these calculations? I guess that's the question. Suppose I have some an object of some arbitrary shape, like that, and I want to calculate the gravitational field at that point. Okay. With point particles, it's easy. I just have a simple equation. But I have a distribution of mass, and each piece that makes up that object contributes a different amount to the total value of g. So what I need to do is break that object up into a bunch of teeny tiny pieces and calculate the value of g for each piece that makes up the object and sum over all of them. So I, I gotta make this, this thing infinitesimally small. I gotta break it up into a bunch of dms. And then write a vector, a unit vector that points from the source of the field to the point at which I'm calculating the field. Now I'll call this unit vector R hat. And just give me a second, I gotta close the door because I hear all kinds of sounds. <clears throat> Do me a favor to get, if somebody, if somebody uh, is not that door is locked, somebody tries to come in, just can you get one of you guys open the door for me? Because otherwise I can take care of this thing. Um, we need to know an expression for dn. We need to know an expression for r hat. So you that's the unit vector that tells you the direction uh, that's going to be related to the direction of the field. Okay, minus this vector is the direction of the field. I also need to know the length of this vector. So basically what I need to do is calculate this thing called dg. G, G. 
which is going to be capital G, our gravitational constant, times whatever my dn is, over the length of that vector squared that goes from the source of the field to the point at which I'm calculating the field, and put a minus sign here, and then the r hat. And so I need a, to, this dn for every object that makes up this thing. So here's another dn. Okay, I can call this R1, I can call this R2, I can call this N1 and N2. If I want to find the total field at this point, you think about it, suppose I had a, a, a sensor that measures field. I put the sensor here, I, I, I would be measuring the field at this point. I want to predict what that value is in this, in this calculation. If I want to find the total field at that point, I got to add up all the contributions. Well, I have an infinite number of terms in my equation, and these are infinitesimal. So, what does that mean? Interval. I have to set up an interval. Oh, I just turned on again. Sorry. Okay. So, what does that mean? Well, I just set up this thing. I go g is minus the integral of g dm over r squared r hat. So, I set up this integral. So, that's how we calculate the gravitational field due to some sort of mass distribution. When you take your next course, when you do E and N, the masses will become charges. This constant will change. The process is the same. Is that with respect to R? I'm sorry? Is that with respect to R? What is it? Like, is it dr? Oh, this? Well, no. Like, the whole interval, like, what do you think with respect to? Whatever this dm is. Oh, okay. It, it's going to depend on how, it, it's going to depend on the geometry. I see, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, if it, I mean, if it's a sphere, I'm probably gonna, it's going to be in terms of R. Yeah, okay. um, it could be in terms of X. It depends on how I define my coordinate system, etc. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so what I've written down on the board, what, what I will write, I'll show you on, on the screen, is the algorithm that we use to actually perform this calculation. I should say one more thing. In all the problems that we do here, the source of the field is going to be at the origin. Okay? If the source of the field is not at the origin, in other words, if the origin is over here, I have to <coughs> calculate the difference between Uh, the vector r and our source. Okay, if my if my source is not at the origin, then I got to take into account, if my origin isn't in here, then I got to take into account uh, where this point is, and that's that vector our source. This is our source. I'm going to make that essentially zero. That makes the calculation easier for us. Okay, so the origin is somewhere over here. So, here's our algorithm. You choose a coordinate system. You write an expression for your dm. You determine the length of the vector that goes from the source to the point at which you're calculating the field. And then you got to determine your r hat. You got to write an expression for this, and a lot of times it's actually hard to write that expression, especially if the problem is three dimension. Okay, you might not be used to setting up or writing down where r hat is. It turns out that in a lot of the problems that we're going to be doing, the symmetry in the problem. 
And if you can argue some of those components to be zero, then you only need the component of our hat that's going to contribute to the field. The example I'm going to do in a minute will illustrate this. Okay? Once you have all these terms, you put them together, and you perform the integration. And then you check to see if your result makes sense. And so I'm going to apply this to a rather difficult problem. It's a ring of mass in the xy plane. And we're going to calculate the field at some point above the plane. So I'll draw it on the board here. Here's a ring. And I'm going to use a ruler to show the x-axis. So this 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 goes through the center of my ring. And let's say I want to calculate the field right here at the end of the ruler due to that ring of mass. You know, like the rings of Saturn or something. You know what I mean? Okay? I want to find the, calculate the field due to this ring. And let me say something about the ring first. Okay? <clears throat> Calculating the field at the center of this ring is easy. What is G at the center of ring? What is it? Why? You are, you're, you're pulled equally in every direction, right? Alright, so here's the point X. If, if I break this up into two small pieces, and let's look at opposite sides of the yeah, we do. Let's pretend that this is uniform for now, for this problem. So yeah, let's assume that this is a uniform mass density. If it's not uniform, then my answer is not going to be, it's going to be a little more complicated. So we, let's assume uniform density. I'm not showing that in your PowerPoint, sorry. Let's, ass, let's assume uniform density. The field at this point, due to this object, points this way. The field at, at this center, due to this object, of equal mass points in the opposite direction. They cancel out. I can go all the way around my circle and do, the, and do this. And I'll get complete cancellation of the field at the center. But out of the plane, that's not the case. Okay? Out of the plane, it looks like you have, G has three dimensions, but actually it doesn't. Right? Or G has three components, but it actually doesn't. Can you think of G as a bunch of triangles that go around it? Or go around the center point with the hypotenuse being the actual variety? And then the point bottom of the hypotenuse triangle being the, the center of the mass? Right. You mean you're talking about uh, if you drew a vector that pointed Towards the mass, you have a triangle, which is and then all the line like, cancels out. All the ones in the plane, right? Yeah. That's that's absolutely correct. Right? Because if you drew a vector, the vector from this point, oops, the vector is going to point directly at that mass, right? And I can do this all the way around. And all the components in the plane are going to cancel, isn't that true? The only component that's not going to cancel is the one along the axis, the z direction. Does that make sense to you all? Okay. Like, like Hunter was saying, I can draw triangles to represent G because G is going to have a component in this direction and a component in the plane. The components in the plane are going to cancel out. Okay, that's going to help us a lot when we're writing our unit vector R hat. Okay, it's going to make a big difference for us. Okay. So, what is the first thing that I have to do? 
I want to write my I want to write an expression for dm. Okay, so let me redraw this. Actually, there's something else I want to bring up, but I'll bring it up at the end. I want to bring I want to break this up into a bunch of DMs. I need to make my mass small enough so that the R vector is the same over that entire mass. That's how I look at it. And the R vector is meaning the vector that goes from the source to this point here. You, got, you all did a worksheet on distributed masses, so again, you want to refer to that. How long is this piece? Well, the radius is r. And what's this angle? Well, this, this angle's got to be small. It's d theta. The distance is r. How long is that piece? It's r d theta, right? So it's the arc length. Now, the mass is uniformly distributed. The total mass of that thing is m. So lambda is whatever that mass is over. The circumference. So then my dm is going to be m over 2 pi r r d theta the r's cancel and I get my dm is m over 2 pi d theta now my qu the question I, I, I want to ask myself is does that make sense is that correct well if I integrate this over all angles what do I get when I get m so, so we're fine. Okay? We're fine. So now I have my dm. Now, what is the length of the vector that goes from this point to that mass? Yeah, if the distance my finger is from the plane is c then my r is going to be the square root of r squared plus z squared. So our r is the square root of the radius of the ring squared plus z squared. Okay, and, and it's, it's, the, it's the magnitude of the vector. In my equation, am I going to use r or r squared? R squared. R squared. So R squared is just big R squared plus Z squared. Okay, two down, one to go. My R hat. R hat has three components in this problem. Here's actually up again. Hold on a second. My R hat has three components. Remember, R hat goes from the source of the field to the point at which you're calculating the field. So R hat goes from here to here. It's a unit vector. And I'm only going to write down one of the components because we already said that the X and Y components cancel. So I just want to write down the z component of r hat. Okay? So r hat is going to be some stuff plus something in the k hat direction. The z component has a cosine alpha in there. 
The X and Y components are in the plane that involve the sine of alpha. So the Z component just has cosine alpha k hat. And alpha is constant. All the way around the ring, alpha is the same value. Isn't that true? Because the radius is constant. And so we can write our hat as some stuff from geometry, if you look at that on, on, the, uh, on, the, on, the, um, on the PowerPoint, isn't it going to be adjacent over hypotenuse? And you get this. So we have everything. And now we gotta put it all together. My DM is this thing. Um, my R is, or my R squared is this thing. And then the R hat term is this. I can combine these two terms, correct? And so, well, let me rewrite, let me write, rewrite my DG, I guess. Minus g m over two pi z over r squared plus z squared and three halves I had all the terms d theta a half and so now I got to integrate over all angles. And what you'll find is every, all this stuff is constant. Now, can you all look at an integral? Okay, that's not a tough integral to do. And what you'll find in a lot of these problems that you do, it's, it's not the integral that's going to give you trouble, it's setting it up. Let's see how four and the cosine alpha. What's the This one? Yeah. What is this? It's the angle, let me go back a couple. See the angle up there in the, in the drawing? Exciting. Yeah, it's the angle that the vector r makes with the z axis. And so when we integrate this, I'm going to write it down again. When we integrate this, we get 2 pi, 2 pi is cancel. And that's what the expression looks like. The negative sign. And the negative sign, thank you. Okay. Now, to see if this answer makes sense, or if we're on the right track, this answer should tend to something to a certain value if you're really far away. If you're really far away, from the ring, what does the ring look like? Point. Looks like a point particle. So this equation should tend towards that of a point particle when z is big compared to r. Well, if z is big compared to r, I can ignore this, right? Yeah. So I'm 
So if I can ignore it, let me write that. And then I have the following. Let me rewrite this. And what does that become? Zero. No, no, before. I'm just, I'm just making. Z squared. Z, yeah, so it's 1 over z squared, right? <laughs> Isn't that the field into a point particle that's located at the origin? Right? That's, that's yes, right? And so it tends toward that. Okay. So one of the things you can check when you, when you perform when you do these problems, you can see what what the equation looks like when you're really far away. It should be that at a point particle. Okay. Now I'm not going to do the problem here because I probably won't have time. But I want to I want to state um, the answer to another problem. And then you can try this at home to see, to see how you do. Okay? And you can use this as your starting point. So you can use this as your starting point. So here's the question for you to try at home. Replace the ring with the disc. Okay. So replace the ring with the disc. Calculate. gravitational field at a point C above the Z axis. Okay. Again, the the, the disk is centered at the origin. <coughs> is there a way to simplify it if it's centered like above the edge of the ring? Say that again? Like, is there a way to simplify it if it's above the edge of the ring and not below the or not the center of the disk? If it's like at a different point? Yeah. So I'm, I, need, I need to talk about that. So, so if you're off axis. Yes. Okay, so let me. I need to talk about what happens when you're off axis. But let me let me write the answer down to this for the disk. Okay? And then you can practice. And this is uniform disk, okay? To do a non-uniform disk, then you gotta use a non-uniform disk. So that's the answer for a disk. Uniform disk. Okay? It's good to practice on these because guess what you're going to do in the next course? You're going to do a uniformly charged disk and then you're going to let the disk become infinitely large. Okay? And then you get, you get the field of an infinite plane. You can do that here too if you want. Is that supposed to be negative? Um, yeah, there should be a there should be a negative sign in there, which I don't have. Well, I should get rid of the Z, but... It's going to be along the Z direction. Okay? So you try that one, and you can let the, 
You can let R go to infinity and see what happens. That's fun too. Okay, you can make it an infinite this. And then you can also go real far away and see what happens. So you can you can try all those because we in your next course you're gonna do this problem. That, that's actually an important problem in this course. Okay. Now what about if you're off axis? That's the question that was brought up. You can set up the problem, okay? It's not a big deal to set up the problem. You have to write your equation for r, right? Or r squared. You have to write the proper equation for r squared. Then you have to write the proper expression for r hat. But when you do that, you and you try to integrate it, when you do an off-axis problem for, for the ring or the disk, you'll find that there is no way to integrate it and get it analytically. You will not get an analytical expression, right? Because there's some integrals you can't do, except on the computer. So, so when you do them off-axis, you got to you got to use, you know, for some sort of you got to write code. You got to do Simpson's rule or, or trapezoid rule to evaluate the integral. Now, when you learn more math later on, there are some ways to make approximations to the to the to the integral. You can write the integral, the term the integral in terms of a series. So and then you can perform the integration. So you can't do it like as a polar integral or like a... You won't be able to do it. As long as you're off axis, you won't be able to do it. It doesn't matter what, what kind of coordinate system you use. But um, there are ways of approximating, especially in the terms of the, in the denominator, and you'll expand them into series, and then the integral can be done, except that now you have this, you can integrate it, but then you have an infinite number of terms. Okay, and then you keep how many terms you need for your accuracy. So you can do that, or, or you can use Simpson's rule of rest and code. Okay, so you had a question? It's in the direction negative k bar, so it's opposite of z when we're doing these problems. Right, points are the source, right? Okay. Because we have this. Z is the source, or the point Z away from this. So, so here's the disk, right? Uh -huh. And here's the Z axis. That's positive Z, right? Yeah. The field points that way. Okay. So that's the negative Z. Yeah. Because that's where it's located, it's located at the origin. If, if we were below the origin, Right? If we were below the origin, then we in the positive direction. Perfect. Okay. We okay so far? All right. So I'm going to prove an important theorem. You just have to bear with me on this, on this theorem. Okay. I need to turn the lights down a little bit because of the colors of my slide. They, they used to show up well before, but now they don't. The person in the video will show fun. Can you kind of see that? Okay. So, uh, I want to prove something called a point master, but before I go on, I, there is one thing I, put, I, I didn't mention and I forgot to say earlier. And I want to say it now. Suppose I have some arbitrary mass distribution. We wrote down the equation for d g, right? G. Write q. What if I put a mass here? We'll call it mu. And now I want to calculate the potential energy that this mass experiences. Well, you know potential energy is minus g m1 m2 over r, correct? But 
That's an extended object. So if I want to find the potential energy, guess what I have to do? I have to break that piece up and put that into a lot of different pieces and sum up. Okay? And so uh, I have to write a du equals um, minus g dm, I'll call this mu, over r. Remember, r is the, the magnitude of the vector that goes from the source to the point of which you're, uh, or to the, to the object in this case. Question? And if they were both more than, a, or they were both non point masses? Then I gotta do double integral. Well, I gotta do two integrals. Okay? And, and I don't wanna say double integral because if they're three dimensional, I'd have to do six integrals. That sounds like fun, doesn't it? Once you know how to do more than one, just at the same time. Yeah, that's, that's all it is, right? So, because if I have to integrate over both objects if, if I have two extended objects, and each integration could be three dimensional objects, so it's six integrals. So yeah, you'll, you'll see in physics you can do a lot of integrals at one time, okay? Especially when you do multi-particle things. Okay, but let's not worry about it. You don't have to worry about those, okay? Not here. So what I want to do is I want to look at G, Okay, I want to look at the behavior of G, but I'm going to do it in a different way. I'm going to actually look at the energy stored in the system between that empty sphere, the spherical shell, and the point mass mu. Okay? That's what I want to do in this problem. Once I calculate the energy stored, I will be able to deduce things about the gravitational field. Is that, can you see that okay in the back? Okay. One of my projects at the end of the semester is to change colors. What's the red line again? Okay, I'm going to get to that. Oh. Okay. So my goal is to write an expression for du. I have to break up that solid, not, that spherical shell into a bunch of infinitesimal masses. So that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to take that spherical shell and break it up into a bunch of rings. That's, the, that's that red thing that you see in, in the diagram. Okay. See, I want to set up this integral, but I need to write an expression for my dm for the sphere. I also need to write an expression for r, for the r, which is going to be fun. Okay? So just bear with me as we go through this. And we did this earlier this semester when we calculated the moment of inertia of an empty sphere. I'm going to use the same process. So I have a, so I have a hollow sphere, and I want to break it up into a bunch of rings like you see in the figure. And the way I look at it is this. I want to know what is the mass of this piece, okay? What is my dm of this thing? Well, it's going to be the mass per unit area times the area. We're going to assume, in this problem, the mass is uniformly distributed. So, and we know the total mass of the sphere Now, I gotta write down what the what the what the uh, radius of the sphere is. I'm gonna call the radius of the sphere A. Because we're gonna have a lot of R's to deal with. I'm gonna call it the radius of the sphere A. So the surface area of the sphere is 4 pi A squared. So I need to write an expression for DA. So 
Let's pretend I had a pair of scissors and I was able to cut this out and make it straight. Um, what would be the circumference of that? Now I gotta be careful. Because R is this radius, right? That R changes, right? That, that R changes depending on where you are in the sphere. So isn't it true, if I write angle theta there, isn't it true that my R is A sine of theta? Do you have a question? Okay. You said it wouldn't be before, so. I'm sorry? No sphere of No, we're not doing that here. I know. How thick is this piece? Yeah. Well, this is an arc length, though, right? Yeah. So it's going to be A D theta. So my DA is 2 pi A sine of theta A theta. Let me rearrange. dA is 2 pi a squared sine of theta d theta and my dn So why is it A D theta? Or oh, this is an arc length, right? Okay. The radius of the sphere is A, and this angle is D theta, right? Arc oh. length is R times an angle, right? Okay. Okay, so so now we have our DN. That was a pain. Okay. So let me show that in, my, in, the, in our PowerPoints. Because this, or because my U is a scalar, I don't have to find R head. I just got to find the, the, the R, right? Because my goal is to figure out this term and then figure out this term. Now let's take a look at the picture up here. The R vector is the distance from the ring to the point particle. So let me draw, let me redraw the picture. You'll see this is kind of a, a, a mathematical challenge. And it's not as bad as it really is, or as it looks as it looks like, I should say. So um, let me redraw that. Here's that ring. That's supposed to be straight away. Here's mu. R is this distance.
That's A. That's theta. Let me draw that and let me show you that in the, in the picture. Oops, sorry, that's not data. This is data. Kind of right. This distance we'll call big R because that's how far the centers are. How am I going to write this little r? Not the law of sines. Law of cosines. R squared, or little r squared is big R squared plus A squared minus 2A big R cosine theta. So that means R is the square root of this thing. everything together. There it is. So I have to integrate that. Right? Because I have my R, I have my BM. So U then is minus the integral of G DM dm is m over 2 sine of theta d theta times mu divided by this mass and what are my integration limits? Well I gotta integrate over all these rings, all I gotta go is from 0 to pi and I have all the rings. Right? If I go from 0 to pi I get all the rings. So now you got to do that integral, which you can do in calculus, right? But I'm going to have to kind of go through this in the detail. I'm not going to write the answer down. You can actually use u sub to evaluate this integral. I'm going to define the Greek letter psi as R squared plus A squared minus 2 AR cosine of theta. And then what is D psi? You see how that comes out, how that works out so nice. Because when you perform the integral, right, you have a sine of theta d theta. There it is. Right, so you have a b psi there. And then the whole denominator is the square root of psi. So basically, you end up with, we'll deal with the limits later. Side, right? One over because of the square root of psi, right? And so I'm going to just show you that in the PowerPoint notes. I want to write all that stuff on the board. Okay, and in the video you'll be able to see this. Okay. So that's what the integration becomes because you have d psi over the square root of psi. What's that? Um, m over 2 times mu? 
Yeah, yeah that's a mu, because I forgot to write down the mu. I'll make it bigger. Sorry. I should make it bigger, because I'm videotaping this. And so I'll show you on the board, or on the screen, what u is now. Now you got to consider the limits. We got to plug in the limits. Of course, when theta is pi, you get negative one. When theta is for, for cosine of theta. When theta is zero, you get cosine of theta equals positive one. So that's your expression that you get for u. But now we got to be careful because we have square roots here. Those square roots have plus and minus terms in front of them. Depends on whether, whether we're inside or outside the sphere. Now look at the first term. What is that first term equal to? Yeah, both of our perfect square. One is a plus b, the other one is a minus b. But I, I gotta I gotta be careful about the second term because I gotta keep it positive. So if yeah, so if um, we're Inside the square, we got to write a minus r. If we're outside the square, we got to write r minus a. Because we got to keep that second term positive. That makes sense. Yeah, but actually, because g divided by two, d, 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 d,
The A is the radius of the sphere. So what does that say about you inside the sphere? If the point, if the mass is inside the sphere, what does that say about the potential energy? No matter where you are inside the sphere, it's the same value. Inside the sphere, potential energy is constant. Okay, let me let me not go. Let me, let me say some more about this. So inside the sphere, the potential energy is constant. Again, force is the derivative of that with respect to R. So the force Is that equal to? Is the derivative a constant? Zero. Zero. So if you're inside a spherical shell, if you, have a, if, if you have a point mass inside a spherical shell, it's not going to experience a force. Further, if you divide by mu, that means g equals zero inside a spherical shell. Even if you have a cavity, if you go inside the cavity, and this is the thing, this is all solid. If you're inside the cavity, G is zero. And if you put a mass in there, the potential energy is going to be constant. So if we were to say potentially a half fold was hollow in the center, you could go in there and be fine. If that's possible, yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah, there you go. You can get away from it. So, what's the conclusion of this? Well, first of all, the mass outside of the shell does not contribute to the force or the field. This means that the field a distance r from a solid sphere of radius r depends on the mass enclosed inside the sphere of radius r. But I think I have time to actually do two examples. Which is good. Are we okay so far? This is a really important idea because in, in, in the next process you're going to use the same idea for charges. Okay. Let's say we have a solid sphere and it's uniform, the mass is uniformly distributed inside the sphere. I want to find the field everywhere inside and outside the sphere. Okay? So here we go. So what does this statement mean? It means that G is equal to big G as a mass enclosed over R squared R hat.
And that's what I mean by enclosed. It's the, the mass enclosed inside a, a sphere of radius r. Right? And I'm just doing spherical problems. Okay, I'm just doing spheres right now. Okay. If it was a cylinder, then it would be the, the mass inside a cylinder. Okay, so what is the uniform case? So, here's a solid sphere. I want to calculate the field at this point in space. And I'm doing a, a sphere. The sphere this field is going to be radially, it's going to be radially dependent. So I'm only going to focus on calculating the magnitude. I'm going to ignore the r hat part. Okay, I forget the minus sign. I'm going to ignore the r hat part. I just want to calculate the magnitude of that field, the field strength. Okay. So I need to write an expression for dg. G. I don't know why I keep writing q. And I'm not going to write the unit. The, I'm not going to write it as a vector because I'm just dealing with problem spherical symmetry here. I need to write my dm for a sphere. I mean, it, it should be obvious to you because we did the point mass there. That my final answer should be gm over r squared, but I want to show you that. What's my dm for a sphere? Well, this three-dimensional dm is rho dv. Rho is the mass over the volume. Let's make the radius of the sphere a. Otherwise, we're going to have to deal with too many R's. Okay. And then, how, what's the element of volume for a sphere? Well, take the derivative of this respect to R. Yeah, be careful. A is the radius of the whole sphere. R is an arbitrary, the radius of the arbitrary sphere. Does that make sense? A is the, the radius of the whole thing. I want to write my dv for a spherical shell of arbitrary radius r. In other words, I want to just think of this sphere as made up of a bunch of layers of an onion. And I need to write the expression for the volume of that layer of onion of arbitrary radius. Uh, supposed to be a squared or this is our square thing. Okay? So what does the end look like then? Cancellation. Is my math okay? Okay. So let me put this over here. And I'm not going to worry about the minus sign now because I'm, I just want the magnitude. Wait, what about the n? Yeah. Oh, I forgot the n. Thank you. That's why I asked you guys to check, so. I have to be careful with my labels. I have to be careful with my labels. And there's an A cube, right? There's an A cube there. Thanks for that.
This R, this R, they're not the same. This R is has to do with what's, what's inside the sphere. This R has to be the distance from the center of the sphere to the point. Okay, so let me call this big R. So big R is this distance, which you know, messy. Okay, that's big R. So I, I, would, I gotta, I gotta write it like that. Is that okay? G then is going to be the integral G M 3 R squared over A cubed R squared dr. I got to integrate over all values of R that make up this. So I got to go from 0 to A. And then what do I get when I, when I uh, let me let me pull some things out. What does that end up giving me? Which is what you would expect, right? Point you like a point max. I'm sorry? With the the and the oh, when you integrate this, you get the cube over three, right? I thought that's smaller than the orange of point to point inside. We're not inside, we're outside. Uh, right? This is a point outside. These are inside. Now let's go inside the sphere. Let me draw the sphere again. Inside the sphere, my dg or my g, I'm sorry, the magnitude of g, g and the mass enclosed over r squared, which is this r, but it's also going to be the radius of the sphere that's inside there. Okay. So the field at this point is going to be dependent on how much mass is inside that the sphere of this radius. Does that make sense? It's what's ever outside doesn't matter. So everything's going to be the same as up there. So in this case, the M enclosed is only the smaller sphere, or is it still the whole? It's a small, because we're only going up to here, right? So I got it only integrate up to here because that's what's enclosed inside the sphere. Okay. Whereas here, the R is the, the radius of the sphere goes all the way around here, but what's enclosed is this this stuff. Okay. There's nothing outside of it. Okay. 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 So again, we proceeded before. Our dm is, is this. I gotta be careful though, because I still gotta break up. Whatever's inside here into a bunch of spherical shells, right? And then I have to integrate from the origin to whatever this point is. 
So I'm going to call these primes. In math, they call dummy variables. Okay. So I'm going to have a, 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 an imaginary sphere, or an imaginary spherical shell, thickness dr, dr prime, and radius r prime. And so our dg g times 3 r prime squared m dr prime over a cubed r squared. That's what this r is. So let me rewrite this. This R and this R have to be the same because you're looking at the field at this point. That's the radius of the sphere. Question? Wouldn't that be the exact same as the one above because they're except for it's on the surface all the time? I'm just changing the limits of integration. You're right. Yeah, because like all the outside shells, or any of them has outside there, would be affected. So it might be just yeah. the Well, the setup is the same. I'm just changing the limits. OK, so let me, let me continue. This becomes what? Dr prime. Over two. Yes. So I get r cubed over 3, right? And so this becomes 3 is canceled. G M R over A cubed. So if you plot it, <coughs> g as a function of r, where's this, what's this dependence? It depends linearly on r, right? Once you're at the surface, once you go beyond the surface, it goes as 1 over r squared. That's what the graph looks like. It's always going to be one power higher than the density. You know why? I mean, inside, it's always going to be one power higher than the density. Why? Because mass goes as r cubed, and the denominator goes as r squared. So inside is always going to be one power higher than, than your density. The density was linear. So your density was constant, so one, one, pow one power higher is R. Okay, so here comes your homework problem, and here comes your test problem, your exam problem. I'm going to do that now. Same problem. Now we're going to take the notes, right? Same problem. I know we're going towards the end, but this does me. This one. Instead of having a uniform mass density, let's have a non uniform mass density. Okay? Let's let the density be uh, let's see, what well, should I make the mass density be? D R cubed. I think that's what I used the other day. So let's use that. Process is the same. So let's do it. This is the outside. The one, the one below. 
The one underneath is inside. So let's go outside. So how does this change? Dm ends up being d r cubed times 4 pi r squared dr. That's how our dm changes. And so up here, this becomes This becomes it's a D. So you get that. What do I get when I perform this integration? That doesn't look right. G goes away. Oh yeah, the G does not go away. The D is still there. Okay? Guess what? If I know the mass of this thing, I can figure out D, correct? Yeah. I'll do that last. Remember, remember that worksheet. Okay? So that's what it's like outside. Let's go inside. Again, I have the same dn. The top one is the outside, this is the inside. Remember, I use dummy variables inside. Yes, thank you. What does this give me? That's a G not a six, so let me do it for That gives me R to the sixth over six, right? Uh -huh. R minus six. Okay, R. I'm sorry? Is it R minus 6 in the after it's been integrated? No, because here's my limit, right? Oh, yeah. Sorry. And again, remember that it's, one, one, it's going to be one power higher than the density, which I got. Okay. Question? On the test, can we just say that the internal one is the other one, the one power higher? No, you gotta do the work. Okay. Right, this is a clue that, you know, this, that's the clue that you get the right answer, right? <coughs> okay, well, use it. That, yeah, you can use it, to, you know, you can use it to work towards that, right? Okay, now, 
What am I left with? And, and I need to look at my, because I'm going to have to use another board. Hold on a second. I got to look at my video. So I'm going to use, I can go this far. I'm going to use this board to figure out what D is. Okay? This is from that worksheet. So, we know the mass of this thing is M, right? M is going to be the interval from 0 to A times my DM that's right here. This doesn't work very well. So what is D? Right? 3 over 2n, 3 over 2n, pi a to the 6. Okay, let's substitute, let's, sub let's substitute, let's go up there. This was outside the sphere, right? Four times three is twelve. And then I have twelve in the numerator and twelve in the denominator, right? Mm -hmm. And so doesn't that give me right? Yeah. Four times three is twelve in the numerator, six times two is twelve in the denominator, they cancel. Now let's go here. Let's put in D. I's cancel. Four times three is twelve. Numerator. 12 in the denominator. So what does that give me? G, M, M, R to the fourth over A to the sixth. Now watch this. At the surface, if you're at the surface of the sphere, you put A to the fourth here, right? Yeah. And you have A to the fourth over A to the sixth equals 1 over A squared, correct? Mm -hmm. On the surface, what do you get? Same thing. They match. They have to match. And so, when you make the graph, this is going to be dependent on the other fourth power, and then this goes down as one of our squared. But here's proportional to r to the fourth. This is proportional to one of our squared. 
So you have a homework problem, just like this, the exponent is different. And on the exam, you'll have the exponent as being different. So this is the problem that's going to be on your exam. It's going to be one of the first problems on uh, your second part of the exam. Okay? Thank you for staying over. I'm going to stop videotaping.